This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Venlier Jerusalem Institute. I'm Dahlia Shenlin. And I'm Gerard Halpern. If you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage, tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll to the bottom, click the big red button that says Patreon, and subscribe. We're counting on you. Every week, we bring you interviews with authors of books and research and other things that have caught our attention and that we find fascinating. Today's interview is brought to you by Tel Aviv University's Stephen Roth Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism and Racism. Our guest today is Amir Teicha. He's professor of history at Tel Aviv University. His new book, Social Mendelism, Genetics and the Politics of Race in Germany, 1900 to 1948, has just been published by Cambridge University Press. Dr. Amir Teicha, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hi, it's really nice to be here with you. So before we talk about Mr. Mendel, the uh, friar who was uh, the father of modern genetics, uh, can you set the stage for us and talk a bit about uh, racial studies in the um, mid-19th to early 20th uh, century in Europe? We think of racial science as, you know, evil of pseudoscience, and you talk about that at length in the introduction of your book. Um, was this field intended to be a social ideology or was this a time when it was treated as an innocuous uh, scientific pursuit? Well, I think we should um, be, be careful, um, as you mentioned, not to, to use our current perspective and use it to think about the past and then treat a, a very lively field of research that many scientists worked in and used to think about evolution and society and people and etc. racial studies and not to think about it as some kind of weird pseudo-scientific pursuit because it wasn't because it was a serious pursuit a serious attempt to use or to to study the morphological variation of humans something which is in a sense, still done today. And to use these different physical attributes of different populations and first of all, study them and document them and then try to see if they mean anything. And that was a complex thing because even just to measure a skull is not, is not a very uh, um, simple thing to do. What, what, what do you measure and how do you measure it? Um, and measuring also has its, its own inter- internal dynamics because once you start measuring one thing, then, you know, one angle, then you go to the next angle and, and one volume and then why this volume and not another one? Um, so uh, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, what we call racial anthropology became established as um, as a scientific field with lots of measurements. Most of them, the, the scientists that, that were doing the measurements weren't sure what they mean, but uh, they thought that if they measure enough, maybe one day they, they would know, you know? So in a sense, it was, let's collect a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, they saw that there is an obvious variability of obvious differences between different populations, and they hoped that they would be able to to understand what, what's, un, what's beneath that. And, and when did uh, uh, Mendelism become social Mendelism? Was there always like a social element to the study of genetics? Is social Mendelism as old as Mendelism itself? Uh, is there a difference between Mendel's research and Mendelism? Yeah, I'll start with you, Dalia, actually. Um, Mendel, as, as you mentioned, was, was this Augustinian monk who worked in the garden and, and cross-pollinated peas during the 1860s. Um, he also did other things, but that is his most famous his most famous pursuit. And there's something very poetic uh, about it. We have to admit. Uh, well, peas. Yeah, cross pollinating right. peas. He grew uh, peas. Uh, very yeah. nice. Yeah. Mendel is the guy who gave peas a chance. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's our I headline. I used to own that yes. T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> and what he discerned in his cross pollinated peas is some kind of of interesting distribution. Uh, in those peas traits, so uh, when he cross pollinated a, a green and a yellow kind variety of peas, then all all their children, in a sense, were were yellow. But when he recrossed these yellow kinds among themselves, then suddenly the green 
uh, popped up again, and in certain ratios, uh, almost quite constant ratios of one to three. And he, he had a, an, in, an ingenious way of explaining that or suggesting an explanation for that, which basically uh, later would become the basis of uh, modern genetics. And that is that, our, that every trait is determined by two um, what we now call alleles or let's say hereditary factors. Sometimes we, we call it genes, but genes, genes is not the, the exact um, term for that. Uh, let's say versions, uh, two versions of a gene. Yeah? So there is a gene for the, the, the color of the P um, and one version of the gene says, P, please be yellow. And the other says, P, please be green. Um, and every um, P contains two copies of these genes. Um, and when these are transmitted to the offspring, then if these two copies are identical, then we know what would you know, be passed on. But if uh, the P has one green and one yellow gene in a sense, then it could pass any of these in the, uh, w w with the same probability. And if you understand all that, then, then you would realize why the first generation of cross-pollinated peas were all yellow, because yellow is what he called the dominant trait, and then in the next gener generation, the recessive traits would pop up again um, uh, in certain ratios. So that was more or less his way of understanding that, or at least this is how he was understood when his studies were rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century. Because one of the famous legends about, about Mendel is that very few people took notice of his studies in 1965 and 66 when he published them. And 1866. About, 18, sorry, 1865, 1866, when he talked about them and published them in a paper. Um, uh, but at the beginning of the 20th century, different scholars first noted that they got the same thing in their own um, studies and then also realized that, hey, Mendel published that before. So, um, And then uh, started what we now call Mendelism. So already we need to distinguish between man, what Mendel did and, and Mendelism because Mendelism began uh, after Mendel was already long gone. Um, so that is maybe... a the beginning of answer to you and uh, to your question. Um, and what I call social Mendelism... Is it your term, by the way? Yes, it's my term. Um, and uh, this term is used uh, as a pun, in a sense, on a term that most people, I think, would recognize or, or would know, and that is social Darwinism. And social Darwinism is, is uh, an expression that I think... Uh, you know, most of the listeners would uh, probably have heard sometime or another. Uh, what Darwin said, we more or less know, right? That he, he gave an explanation of how evolution works. Uh, and in this explanation, there was a, a central place for, for struggle and competition and survival of the fittest and and competition between species and within species. And, and if we understood that, uh, these kind of dynamics, then we may understood, uh, understand evolution, right? So that is Darwin. For dummies. Uh, yeah, for dummies. <laughs> Thank hey, you. we call them dummies. Um, um, and um, it is not difficult to see how these ideas could become and also did become also a social theory. So if we take these ideas from the world of plants and animals and implement them on the world of humans, then we may be able to understand why nations fight each other. Maybe this is also a version of survival of the fittest or maybe why why there is a competition between, I don't know, businesses and startups on whose product is better. So you can use this kind of theory and, and implement it on different spheres of human life. And one of the most well-known examples of that is, of course, the case of Nazi Germany, where the idea that uh, history is basically a racial struggle, and in this racial struggle, um, the Nazis thought that their race has to win against the other races, especially the inferior and and awful Jewish race, and and all all human history needs to be understood as this kind of biological racial struggle. These are things which which are quite um, well known as kind of explanation for for the kind of biological thinking that the Nazis had. But what are the particular aspects of Mendel's ideas or his principles that got woven into this social outlook? 
So, so, so far, I, 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 you know, I didn't talk about Mendel, right? I talked about Darwin. That, that, that's where social Darwinism um, is usually, uh, that, that's where people speak about social Darwinism. But then Mendel, when we speak of Mendel, then, I, you know, we speak of these green and yellow peas. Okay, that's, that's nice. And recessive dominant traits, that's nice. That's also correct, right? I mean, there are traits that are dominant, recessive, I don't know, blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever. Um, it sounds like there's nothing, nothing especially social about that. I mean, it's just this kind of technical and um, true, maybe valid theory of how genes work. And this is the image that most of us have of of um, genetics, of at least of the, of, the, of the basis of genetics, of Mendelism. And that's where I came come in, or that's where my book come, comes in. Um, and what I, I uh, argue in my book is that um, this kind of image that we have of Mendelism, first of all, is um, is an image that was carefully construed after the Second World War. Um, by geneticists who needed to distance themselves from the obvious social aspects of genetics, they they were in a position where it was not really a problem to take racial science and just say, listen, this is pseudoscience, we don't need it. Because at the time, racial science was already an outdated uh, kind of theory. Um, so uh, there wasn't much sacrifice in just saying racial science is pseudoscience. They could not afford doing the same thing with genetics. And what they needed to do is to say, Lolo, uh, listen, um, Mendelism is a true scientific theory. Uh, the context was also Cold War context, where in the Soviet Union, Lysen Lysenkoism, which was this kind of theory about, about um, the inheritance of acquired characteristics, which said that we can just... I don't know, cool some plants and then it would influence their, the, the next generation of plants. And uh, led to massive debacles in agriculture. Yes. Um, so so that, was, uh, that was the, I mean, the, the Soviets themselves said, listen, Mendelism is this kind of uh, awful Western thing. Dec decadent bourgeois yeah, theory. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and in the West or in, especially in the United States, um, there was a need to say, no, 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 Mendelism is the true valid and non-racist and non-ideological, just pure scientific theory. Um, and this is how they construed Mendelism. And this is what uh, the legacy that, that we still uh, live in. But if you look in the first half of the 20th century or the first 40 years or 45 years of the 20th century, you see Mendelism everywhere and everybody recognizes that this is a political theory, this is a social theory, this is a theory that has implications for how we, how we think about society and how we, we, we reconstruct it. And right away it sort of co-opted into other developing fields at the time, right? To sort of help, I think you were talking about the emerging fields of uh, anthropology and racial ideas. Yeah, and, and not only, yeah, and I think we also need to to uh, bring in another term which we didn't mention yet, and that is eugenics. Uh, eugenics, which was coined by uh, Darwin, Darwin's half cousin Francis Galton, uh, which was the intentional attempt to to control human evolution and to make sure that the next generation of offspring uh, among humans will be the best. Um, both qualitatively and quantitatively. So the idea is that there are families that are degenerate families and we don't want them to propagate and have many children. But the good ones who unfortunately have too few children, we need to somehow encourage them. So these are, of course, the, as we said, the, the bourgeois, the intelligent, the upper middle class, the scientists themselves. Um, and into that kind of thinking um, entered mentalism. And yeah, yeah. Oh, go on. No, no. I, I just wanted to say that unlike you know Darwinism, for example, that you know is, is in itself, may I say, a fanciful uh, theory that ended up you know proving itself right. But it's it was you know what for many people, uh, um, rightfully, I think was uh, one bridge too far. There's something very technical about mentalism, right? They're about genetics in general. There are the genes, you know, the uh, genetic material, you know, you do what you do with it and then it comes out. It's almost like, you know, a, um, an assembly line in a way. What, what uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think what, in, in what way it could have been 
manipulated and later on neutralized, as you say, in the post-war uh, context, uh, that uh, you know allowed it to be social in the way that you describe it. Okay, so let's take one term that we already mentioned, and that is the idea of recessive traits. So today when we talk about recessiveness or recessive traits, it sounds like a neutral term. Okay, so they are dominant traits, they're recessive. What's the big deal about But they that? are kind of normative words. Dominant, oh. you know, strong. Recessive sounds weak. Um, At least in English. I don't know in German. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm fine with that. That's good. That's good for my thesis. That's uh, yeah. perfect. Um, but that, the, the weak recessive has this kind of interesting quality. Um, and that is that it reemerges when it meets another weak of its own kind. Uh, This is the and, revolution. And, and then um, there is an issue of of the fact that we don't know what traits, I mean, the dominant traits are the ones that we see, but the recessive traits we cannot see. So the whole preoccupation with heredity becomes a preoccupation with uncovering the unseen genes, right? So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what, what kind of recessive traits you have, and that's, therefore I cannot know what kind of traits your children might have. And this kind of hide-and-seek idea or game that humans started playing with the, the genetic material of the population uh, already sounds a little more social than, than the previous one, right? Because, because there's something hidden and, and we, we want to sure, see who has these kind of hidden genes and why and how do we make sure that they, they don't continue to... to uh, and, and if they might be pathological, then what do we do with them? And by the way, in German itself, the, the words for, for, for dominant and recessive were words for cover and uncovered. Okay, so this is the, oh. the, the, the... That does bring a whole new psychological yeah. mm -hmm. and social That's psychological layer really. into yeah. it. And, and of course, I can, I can go on and, and I would go on, but let me just give you a, an example from like 10 minutes further into our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is of, of uh, a physicist uh, by the name of Fritz Hautermanns. Who in 19, in, in, after the Nazis took power, uh, fled from Germany and found himself in Ukraine. And um, he got a job there in some research institute. And uh, he needed to fill out some kind of form where he needed to say things about his parents and grandparents. And this was just after the Nuremberg laws were passed in Germany, which defined who is a Jew and who isn't a Jew according to to, by the way, Mendelian logic, uh, at, least, at least partially. And then he wrote there that he is a Jew, even though he had just one Jewish grandfather. And even according to Nazi standards, he, shouldn't have he was considered German-blooded because he needed to have at least two or more to be considered um, a Jew or at least a half-Jew. Um, and then his wife told him, why are you writing that? And his answer to her was, I translated into, um, into English, he said, I want, I want to, I want to outmendle out myself. Outmendle, that's oh, how you yes. write it in the book, yeah. Yeah. What is this outmendling, you know? So, um, and this outmendling for him meant uh, that he, he would allow his Jewish genes, in a sense, to be uncovered uh, or, or that he discloses them. Now, where does he take that from? Uh, he takes it from the fact that by that time, uh, Mendelian ideas and even Mendelian terminology, even the, 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 the word Mendel became a verb in German that was used to talk about uncovering also Jewish traits, not only Jewish traits, but also Jewish traits. Um, and I, in one chapter before the last one in my book, I also show that Hitler uh, himself, um, we have several quotes of him, you know, where he furiously shouts that that we need to outmendle all those Jews, uh, even though in the sixth or seventh generation you can't know that that they are Jews, but they they are, and we would, uh, if we would work correctly, we need to outmendle them because the Jewish genes are too strong or things like that. So Hitler was certainly not, um, um, you know, a scientific thinker, uh, but even he uh, somehow absorbed some of these ideas and terminologies and the ways of thinking about these hidden factors that we need to to uncover. Um, so this is just um, just one example, but 
Yeah. I have an, I mean, this is a little bit technical and maybe gets away from the sociology, from the sociological aspect a bit, but I found it quite interesting that it wasn't even taken for granted that Mendel's theories about peas and by extension vegetation should actually apply to the human race. Can you tell us about that dispute? Well, they shouldn't actually. Um, again, so it's all a fraud? <laughs> it's, uh, in a sense, it is. Um, not a fraud. Uh, I'm right now, this is not in my book yet. It's in a paper I, I'm, I'm writing right now. I'm looking into some of the the most famous examples of Mendelian heredity in plants and mammals. And I took one of them, which is this kind of um, um, cross mating of guinea pigs. Uh, one of them is, is albino and has a, a smooth coat. And the other one has a rough coat and he's black or she is black. And and these are mated, and their their offspring are mated, and then in, uh, in the next generation, these are not two traits, not just one trait. So you get this kind of ratio between the all possible combinations of these traits. And this is a famous example. Anyone who ever studied genetics knows this example because it's, it appears to this day in all in textbooks and pedagogic materials and everywhere. And I tried to to actually find out where this example is taken from. And to make a long story short. It's a fake. Uh, this study was never done. <gasps> the study that was done with guinea pigs um, uh, had different results. Uh, the animals which are shown in all these examples are are not the ones that could really demonstrate the... So, so Mendelism is, is an oversimplification of the way that genetic works. And... Today, we already know it. There is a lot of talk of epigenetics and all kinds of mechanisms. We show how complex the, the process of inheritance and of the expression of gene is. So this is a, an extremely, extremely complicated process. And Mendelism catches really like a, um, a very extreme kind of, of case within this universe of genetic mechanisms. And uh, therefore, it's... Sometimes, you know, there are things uh, for which you can say, if there's a mutation, a specific mutation in a specific gene, which causes usually some kind of pathological phenomenon, then it could apply. And there are some examples for that, that we know them, I don't know, Huntington's disease, for example, Tysaks. Okay, so there are some examples. But these are outliers in a sense. And, um, and of course, they don't apply to personality traits, with it, which I think is the main issue here, right? Uh, they, they don't... They, they cannot apply to, I mean, the, the, the idea of traits. How do you define a trait? A trait is a very complex thing to begin with. Right? And also Mendel's peas. If you look at peas, they don't come in green and yellow. They come in many, many different... Uh, shades tints, of green. Shades of green, yes, and shades of yellow. So even Mendel, he had to decide for many of his peas, this is green, this is yellow, even though the actual peas were you know, on, on a wide spectrum between these two poles. But I need to say Mendelism was a great advancement compared to what they knew of genetics before that. So, uh, so it was a breakthrough to use this idea of recessive and dominant traits uh, when what you had before is something that you couldn't quantify, you couldn't understand, there was no logic in it, etc. But for it to become such a dominant paradigm, Many simplifications had to be done with the material, also in plants and animals, not only in humans, and of course also in humans. My next question is, why Germany? I mean, after 1933, I think the answer is pretty clear. But before that, your inquiry starts in 1900. Uh, was it because Germany was a hotspot for social mentalism and, you know, related issues at the time? Uh, or, you know, just is the spotlight thrown on it retrospectively because of what ha happened after 1933? My spotline is retrospective. In the last chapter of my book, I also look at mentalism in other places and other nations. And mentalism was also very strong in America, uh, in, in the United States. There, the, the main issue you was, the, was what they called feeble-mindedness. Uh, so you can find all these kind of Mendelian poems and theaters and 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 uh, posters and whatever and and most of them deal with the problem of feeble mindedness which is recessive and therefore we cannot know where it is and we need to do intelligent tests or kind of IQ tests in order to discover who who is actually 
slightly retarded uh, in, in their language or idiotic or moron. They have all kinds of I terms for I think the poem that. that you reprinted in the book actually advocated sterilization, right? Yes, yes. Sterilize all these misfit um, because this is Mendel's law. Um, and um, so this is in the US. In Britain, the main problem is the paupers, is like the, you know, the, uh, the, the lower... Uh, economic society of all these poor people who cannot work and don't work and, and remain poor. It says an poor. awful lot about the social DNA of the communities. America is founded on racism and Britain was founded on class. Yes, yes, it's there. And then Mendelism is applied for that. So, 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 there, um, so, uh, so there the fear is that if we give money to the poor, then the recessive trade. So again, it's, it's you know, Mendelism is applied. In Germany, uh, Germany was, well, Germany was, was um, a very strong um, uh, scientifically and medically, na- right? It was a, a nation that a everybody powerhouse. came. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, a powerhouse, and um, and also biologically speaking. Uh, so it was quite nat- natural for for Mendel to become strong there. Um, well, I don't know, say natural. Historically, it became strong there. Uh, in neighboring France, for example, Mendelism was more or less rejected. They said, no, it cannot work. It's too simplistic. Heredity is more complex than that. We need to look at how, uh, I don't know, the health of women when they are pregnant and then their children will be better. So, you know, it was a complete, completely different direction. And these, you cannot explain it simple, uh, just by scientific issues, you know. So science and ideology and those kind of different cultural uh, roots are intermingled here. Um, and of course, my interest was was in Nazi Germany, and then I I need to look before what happened. Um, and of course, Nazi Germany is interesting because because Nazi Germany took biology, al um, simchata, right? So uh, so made it the main issue at least um, at least. Um, and and how smooth yep. really was the tra- transition uh, before and after? You know, from this intellectual scientific preoccupation to something that is actually. Uh, implemented policies. Oh, I'm not sure there's a transition here. It's it's a it's a natural follow up. I mean, the the scientists who who worked on that in the 1920s became prominent in the 1930s, and now they they had um, like um, the, the political system that backed them up and said, "Come on, let's sterilize," and therefore they. They um, legislated the the Nazi sterilization law, which of course wasn't the first sterilization law. The United States started in 1907 already in different states. Uh, But in Germany, it was a a compulsory law. And eventually they sterilized more or less 400,000 of their own people uh, because they allegedly suffered from all kinds of genetic diseases. Well, was there no pushback from the scientific community? Some people saying to the powers that be, hang on a second, science is more complicated than that. Or, or these manifestations of the social policy are bad? Did anybody see it that way? Well, some saw it that way, and then they didn't... Uh, Speak <laughs> out, yeah. <laughs> they, I, I, right. Either they emigrated and <laughs> spoke out from... from other, I mean, uh, there was... A, a genet- I mean, in, in other places in the world, there were geneticist conventions saying what the Nazis are doing is awful, right. etc. Uh, within Germany, it was a little more complex than I want that. to focus on one of the other fields, and this mm-hmm. alludes to something that Gilad said earlier, but also relates very directly to this, to starting with the idea of people with mental disorders. I mean, there's an interesting... It seems to me it's a moment in your book, when the understanding of Mendelism is not only leaps to human beings, but leaps particularly to the field of psych- psychiatry. Yep. And I found that I have like a zillion questions about that. I will spare you all of them. But my real question is, did that approach not run headlong into another very influential figure of the time, Sigmund Freud, who is barely mentioned in your book, I was surprised, because you would think these two approaches to psychiatry would completely clash, one being biological and deterministic, and the other being all about the personal psychology and personal experience. Well, he was in Paris at the time looking at pregnant women. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Freud was not very popular in Nazi Germany. So, um, uh, of course, you're right. And you're right even without... I mean, okay, Freud is... um, Psychoanalysis is... uh, is a certain branch of of psychiatry, but even within within the the more um, let's say the the Kraepelinian psychiatry, uh, which is the one that I deal with, uh, Emil Kraepelin, he was uh, 
he was what to psychiatry, what Freud is to uh, to psychology in a sense. So, um, so uh, and he was a very influential. He was the one that more or less um, um, separated the the complex of of schizophrenia and manic depression, which is still valid today in the DSM and everywhere. So that's Emil Kreplin, who was a German psychiatrist from the late late 19th and early 20th century. Um, within this kind of very dominant um, kind of German psychiatry, there were, of course, other voices. Um, and I mentioned them, but I don't give much space to them because I, my, my focus is on the voices that, that did... Uh, um, uh, think that we can mentalize everything, and one of one of Kreplin's students was Ernst Rudin, which I deal with a lot, and he was a staunch eugenicist and Mendelian. Um, but I also mention other people like Bloiler and others that uh, those who are familiar with uh, with psychiatry would know, and they they objected this kind of reasoning, and they said, no, no, we cannot do this to to psychiatric diseases. We cannot just say that. That every every you know anomaly can be reduced to I don't know two or three genes which control it, etc. Um, so there were these voices as well. Um, yes, there was written there, and I I mentioned them even though I don't go deep into into studying them because as I said my, my focus is on the ones that did adopt the kind of. Mendelian thinking and and then implemented almost everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me that that is, to my in some ways, the major question, right? Do you look at society as deterministic and 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 biologically programmed, or do you imagine that people and thereby society can change? Um, and it seems to me this is a real clash of worldviews. But maybe I'm overestimating it in my mind. No, no, you're saying it correctly, and this is this is why Mendelism was was social all the time, because. Because Mendelism was was also um, associated with the idea of hard heredity, which means that that genes cannot change, we cannot change them. Mutations are rare, but usually pathological, and you know we cannot work with them. There was a moment when there was a thought that hey, if you if that the Soviets actually thought maybe we can adopt Mendelian genetics because mutations show that we actually can change humans and human genetic material. Maybe if we work with radiation correctly, uh, then then we can influence the genes, and and the the, the influence will last for the next yeah, you know, which they managed to do, but incorrectly. Um, but but you know, more often uh, Mendelism was associated with hard heredity, which means we cannot change the genes, and and genes have a very dominant influence on who we are. And if you adopt these kinds of worldviews, um, then you might. Say Say, okay, so you know, social differences are natural and they are genetically determined, and therefore we should not fight them. We should actually see who has better genes and let them control society. And this is once again we see how how it, this, these ideas can easily be connected to to racial superiority, right? And to the idea that certain races are genetically superior, not just because they are, I don't know, culturally superior. And that we whatever. have to try to plan that ourselves for the yes. future. And and if we identify that the best genes are those that belong to the Nordic race, then we, we need to find these genes and we need to recollect them somehow and recombine them. And and therefore, we need to start, you know, going through, uh, I don't know, create the SS uh, and accept into it only people who whose outlook indicates or outlook or behavior indicates that they have the best genes and let them, you know, marry each other. And then maybe we would have in the next generation, a, even a better society, genetically speaking, not only uh, um, behaviorally or otherwise. Just to wrap up, what are the branches of science where Mendelism has a legitimate uh, lasting impact now that we, that we view as a, a normal and healthy scientific pursuit? Uh, and those that Maybe have were very influenced by Mendelism, but are now considered either pseudoscience or wrong politically. Well, the answers are correspondingly uh, modern genetics and eugenics. The entire uh, field but, of but, 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 but yeah. this is, of course, uh, you know, a retrospective separation which 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 just doesn't catch historical realities. Um, so it's very easy to just you know throw into under the word eugenics all the bad things and say, but modern genetics is a fabulous, and it is a fabulous scientific you know it's, it's an amazing scientific field with with also amazing successes, um, uh, which also has within it um, both 
problematic potentials as well as problematic past as well as problematic potential implications uh, and we can see that in you know every now and then in the daily news uh, and when there are all, all these like um, you know the gene for criminality was found and all, all these kind of and the debate stuff. over genetically modified foods I suppose comes from the same place no hmm. I'm not sure mm-hmm. um, but uh, so so, uh, so I think Uh, this is a, co- a, co- a complex issue. I don't have a simple answer. Good. We like um, complex yeah, answers. Absolutely. Now, one yeah. last question, perhaps, before we wrap up now, really. Yeah. Did, did your inquiry into this particular um, issue on, you know, the, on the uh, um, cusp between science and politics lead to broader insights into you know, the nature of the relationship between science and politics? For example, in the contemporary context, like, you know, um, climate change, denialism, Things like that. Can you say anything, you know, beyond uh, Germany in the first half of the 20th century about that? Hmm. Well, climate change is a, is a Chinese hoax. Everybody knows that. <laughs> you know? So um, sure. it's, it's, like, it's like the COVID. It doesn't really exist. It's either a hoax or a, a killer. <laughs> um, <sighs> um, I believe in science. Uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, and I'm so... I think uh, really science is um is an amazing human pursuit um in search of of knowledge and in search of truth um um and it is also a, a very strong a very strong force in the modern world um and in that sense I think it's good that that we will be um Um, a little suspicious and um and you know have our antennas open um to make sure that that science uh, is also used ethically and morally um because it can be used ethically and morally and it can be used for other purposes um so in the in the fight between between science and science deniers i'm on the side of science but within science i'm also on the side of of good science is also science which is open to criticism and this criticism can both be internal criticism and science is usually good in that not always but usually good in uh, because it because the system is built that way right so uh, you know peer review and everything so we are, we keep on being under criticism from all sides as, as scientists and this is good for for science um but it also needs to be criticized from the outside because by definition science is not a moral pursuit Um, it uh, the goal of scientists is to reach truth, and a good scientist, in a sense, should not say to himself, "No, no, but I'm not going there because of, I don't know, because of other reasons." No, uh, um, uh, so we should be the ones saying to the scientists, "Listen, you're not going in a direction which we, as society, uh, would like you and us to go, and that is our goal as citizens and as intellectuals." Halavai, that's uh, Amir Teicher, professor of history at Tel Aviv University. He's been talking about his book, Social Mendelism, Genetics and the Politics of Race in Germany, 1900 to 1948, which has just been published by Cambridge University Press. Thank you for being on the show. In the second edition, I add another year and then it'll be until 1949. <laughs> thank, you for, uh, thank you for hosting me. It was uh, great to be here. And many thanks to Itai Shalom, our sound engineer and producer, and again to the Roth Institute for the generous support. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcast app and would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review of any kind. All you have to do is go to the ratings and review section and write one. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Every little helps. Check out our archive. It has about 600 interviews. And if you like what we do here, you can also like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast, Ideas from Israel, and follow me and Dahlia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from Dahlia and from me, goodbye.